The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. We are back. A's baseball, past, present, and future. I'm Ralph Heiko of the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, and one of the co-hosts are here, the other one expected. Nancy Finley is tardy, but Jerry Feidelberg right on time. How are you, Jerry? Oh, I am doing great. It's hard to believe that a week has passed since we did the last one. Seems like we just did it about 24 hours ago. But well, uh, every day's pretty much the same. Win, win, win. Uh, yeah, can for the, you believe for the age, this? Yeah. Is this something out of out of a uh, a novel somewhere? No, I think they're they're drinking JY Epps special sauce, and uh, that's why they're doing so well. I don't know. Okay. They're just they're, they're a good team. They won seven out of the last eight. Uh, they played uh, two teams that are sort of on the downside the Toronto Blue Jays and the Detroit Tigers. They took all six from those guys. But the last two games were against a quality team and a very good Dodger team, powerful team, powerful lineup. And uh, they played very, very well. Uh, uh, Shamanaya did not pitch well on uh, Tuesday night. And he, he left after two and two-thirds innings worth of work. And uh, he was charged with four runs. But he was not he was not at his best at all. Maybe he was nervous. Who knows? But uh, the the A's lost the game four to two. But last night they held their more than held their own against the Dodgers, and their ace, uh, Cy Young Award winner three times, MVP, how many times? Seven, eight times an All Star, uh, Clayton well, Kershaw, uh, who who pitched uh, five innings. One strikeout. Now, Only one that strikeout. tells you Which... something about the A's right there, that yeah. they're putting the ball in play. And, oh, uh, yeah. They're almost a throwback team um, to me. They hit and run a little bit, steal a base. Yeah. And, and, again, I'm going to um, note uh, Marcus Simeon, how his offense uh, productivity has uh, really improved, but more than that, he's steady in the field now, and he's um, yeah, he's doing a great, very good job, very good job right. in the field. And of course, first and third base, they got two potential Gold Glove winners with Matt Olson at first base and Matt Chapman at third. Chapman has been outstanding, and he leads the league in defensive runs saves. How's that? Wow. Leads the league, saves runs. I start to say about shortstop, there are very few teams without a good shortstop nowadays. It's almost become, um, especially with all the shifting and this, that, and the other thing, and Simeon is uh, is right up there. He's just um, really improved. But I want to note something that's incredible. Their recent success has hinged upon a revamped starting pitching staff. Uh, oh, yeah. you got Cahill, Anderson. Now, yeah. Flyer, uh, am I pronouncing his yeah. name, Flyers? Mike Flyers, right. Uh, and, Mike uh, uh, Flyers. Um, wow. Um, Jackson, Mike, Austin. Ed, Edwin Jackson. Ed, Edwin Jackson. Jackson, Austin's with the Mets. And, um, yeah. uh, they got and John Manaya. Shamanaya. And Shamanaya. Now, if you would have uh, said that a team could lose literally four out of five of their their starters and um, still be in con- not only in contention, but um, their, their odds on favorites to make the playoffs. Yeah, they got it. They, it's it's hard to believe what what they've done. They've used Mengden, they've used uh, Montas, they used Daniel Gossett. They in fact they've used 13 different starting pitchers during the season, which is astronomical. But on Monday they acquired Mike Fires from the Detroit Tigers, and Fires last night was absolutely brilliant. He went five and a third innings, 
the first four innings, he was perfect. 12 up, 12 down, and he had eight strikeouts against the Dodgers, who have Brian Dozier and Manny Machado in their lineup to go along with Justin Turner, to go along with Yasmani Grandal, Matt Kemp, Cole, uh, Cody Bellinger, who was rookie of the year last year. This team is loaded. Max Muncy. Oh, they, right they've with, got uh, Max. What's what's Max's last Ma- name? Max was, Muncy. Uh, Max, Max Muncy, Muncy was former A's farmhand. Yeah. And uh, he's 24, up, so. 24 bombs this year. 24 out of Max. They had three players in the lineup. with uh, They had Machado had 26 homers. But Dozier had 17, Kemp had 17, Bellinger had 17 or 18. Ever, they had nine players, uh, position players, that had double digits in home runs. And, and Chris yeah, Taylor, the players, and, 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 and um, not only that, but they have a probably the best relief pitcher in baseball, Jansen. Um, yeah, he backed up Right up there with seconds. Kimbrell and, um, sure. and Chapman up and a few others. He racked up his 30-second save uh, Tuesday night, and uh, he pitched last night. But uh, the A's were ahead three to two. They are, they are a, uh, you know, they they should be in the hunt for the NL West, and they could be back. And there's no in the uh, NL Central. It's a it's a dog fight between the Brewers and the Cubs. In the East, it's the Braves, the Phillies. Maybe the Nationals, but I don't think the Nationals are going to do it. They're, they're sort of dysfunctional at the moment. But the Dodgers uh, went to the World Series. They know what it's like to be there. They want to go back. They're a good team. And it's up. To, and the A's played them last night. It was like a playoff game. The atmosphere was electric. 33,000 people in the stands last night, 33,600 on Tuesday night. It's phenomenal. And I hate to tell well, you. That's not, what I was going to ask you about. Are you as impressed as I am that the fans are starting to take note and appreciate what, just what a good ball club this is? Yes, the A's fans are. the one. They were much louder than the Dodgers fans. But I, there was a sea of blue all throughout the stadium, a lot of Dodger fans. And uh, I asked the guys to cover the Giants when the Dodgers come in. Do uh, you see this much blue over at AT&T Park? And they said, no, they'd be killed over there if they wore their blue outfits. <laughs> but the uh, it reminds me of the old days in uh, Candlestick. They would have giant Dodger brawls in the stands. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. You, you uh, don't see that I, much. Um, I think after there was um, a horrible instance when a, a giant fan uh, – a first responder, a paramedic, or a fire. Oh yeah, Brian. Brian so it was that. Uh, yes. It was the, yes. The, uh, it was I think it was either 2010 or 2012. Whenever the Giants won their first World, maybe it was 2000. Oh, it started the 2011 season. He went down for the opening day down in uh, at uh, Dodger Stadium, and he was attacked by these two thugs out in the parking lot, and he's he's really. He's, he's he's been ruined for life, if you will. He's never going to yeah. be the same. He got beat up pretty badly. And so, you know, well, the people I met, I met a couple going in there wearing their Dodger uniforms, white with the blue trim. And all I had to say was Dodger fans. They were so nice. They so we live in Salinas. Uh, he says, I grew up in Chino Hills, which is outside of L.A., and my dad was a Dodger fan, so we're Dodger fans. And I said, that's great. You're having a great time. You're at the ballpark. They said, yeah, we're looking forward to the game. Yeah, so there are nice people that go in. Not everyone's a thug. Oh, of course not. Uh, absolutely not. Thank God. But, um, but yeah, that, uh, that kind of that kind of put things into perspective. And I, um, I, I know right. it was at Dodger Stadium. And um, the the kid was beaten so badly, and there were X number of witnesses. They finally um, um, brought the guy to justice, uh, brought the people to yeah, justice. Yeah, both of them, yeah. Did it. Um, that, that, that's horrible. It's uh, uh, a human frailty that, that um, 
that life is worth so precious little it's nowadays. Certainly, yeah, it's, I, sad. I it's sad. It's sad, and it shouldn't happen at a ball game. But I'm going to give you a little inside baseball, something that happened Tuesday night. I was, it was really – it was really quite a, quite an evening for me. I was really excited about it. Uh, I was I went to the game early because not only did they have 33,000 people coming to the to the Coliseum, they had the Hall and Oates concert next door. So that puts another 15,000 people in. So they had over 40, almost close to 50,000 people in the in the both the Oracle Arena and the stadium. But anyway, I got there early, and uh, I went down to dinner with my friend Amari P. Gonzalez, who's the Spanish-language broadcaster, uh, for the A's. Mm. And uh, we, were, we were having dinner, and uh, we were joined by uh, Ray Fossey, who, is, who does the television for the A's. Ray's a former catcher. He's won a, he's a, won a uh, Major League World Series championship with the A's way back when. And has been doing his broadcast in with, with with Glenn Kuiper for a number of years now, and we were also joined by the public address announcer, uh, Dick Callahan, and we're having wow. dinner. We're having dinner, and who stops what by? What a foursome! What? Yeah, Dick Callahan he, has a has some pipes on him. Does he ever? That, yes, um, and Fossey is. Um, charming and he has represented the A's for all these many years um, that that had to be a terrific dinner uh, well there's more to it there's more to right. it if you, I, I'm going to get you in, even into more astounding news who comes over to visit with us none other than Oral Hirschheisen Oral, Oral wow. comes over he, he, he sees Ray shakes hands with Ray with uh, Amari, me, and Dick. And, not, and so we're chit-chatting. And then strolls Rick Monday Rick, and to say hello to oh. Ray. And so we're talking with Rick Monday, Oral High Hershiser, and, the, and one of the voices of the Dodgers broadcast with Charlie Steiner came in also. So how is oh. that for a table? Is that something? Is that, and is they that also the and they said, our master... Is Jerry Feidelberg? Do they? You know, more like, who is that guy? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have um, heard it before. I I would tend to tend to say that they uh, recognize and appreciate your your <laughs> talents and um, all you've done for the A's. You are a terrific journalist and um, thank you, sir. And very accurate. Um, I'm much I. Uh, Appreciate you a lot. That's the best way I can say it. Um, thank you. How about that? Just, yeah. Uh, well, it's, you're an it's just being... to, to the network, and um, wow, that had to be uh, an awful lot of fun. Now, it, it is, is is an analyst. Am I correct? Yeah, he does the broadcast with. Uh, I think he does it with the new guy, Davis, who took over for uh, Vin Scully. He works with him. I think Steiner is on the radio broadcast, uh, maybe on the TV. Well, I don't know, but they, they, they uh, Steiner and Hershiser don't work together. Uh, I think uh, uh, Hershiser does television and, um, Did they? and, and the other Steiner does radio. radio. Radio, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to note that how important Rick Monday's name is. You know, he was an original Kansas City athletic. He yes, he was. First draft choice in the first draft in 19, uh, first free agent draft in 1965. Right. He um, came to fame when he rescued the flag from being and, burnt. And, and Ray brought that up at the, at the table. Ah, he, he okay. I'm also going to give you some other, some other insight about what's going on in the uh, Well, let me just say that he was him. traded for Ken Holtzman. Yes, and he was. And, and that that was one was of those good. few deals in baseball that worked out beautifully for both teams. Yeah, they uh, gave the Cub, he went to the Cubs, played for them, and then didn't the Cubs trade him to the Dodgers? Right. And, uh, and Holtzman won two rings with the, uh, with the A's, I think, in 73 and 74. 
Absolutely. So it was a wonderful deal. Wonderful deal. And I think Billy North came in, was in on that in, on some level, too, if uh, I'm not mistaken. I well, think Billy I did. North came over and played center field. He was a former Cub. Yeah, uh, maybe he was uh, in that deal. Could be. I don't. Uh, was Rick Monday on the '72 team? He must have been on the '72 team that won the. I uh, don't think the... he was. No, he oh, was okay. traded. He was traded before. I okay. uh, equate him with um, with uh, poor UB Brooks with the Mets, who was the <laughs> first yeah, really good. decent third baseman they ever had, and he never stuck around long enough. Um, uh, traded to Montreal, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. But he never never stuck out st- stuck long enough to win a championship with the Mets in '86. Right. So that's how it is sometimes. Guys um, have careers that one thing or another happens that that makes them um, memorable, stand out in our, our memories. But the whole thing where he came in. Some cuckoo was down there with the American flag setting it on fire. Yeah. And yeah. Um, he comes, tackles the guy. And he snatched the really, flag away. Um, yeah, that was, uh, that was memorable. Also want to note that Oral Hershiser starred, uh, played a big role in a recent documentary on the uh, – Bob Gibson, not Bob Gibson, um, uh, the Gibson with Detroit. Uh, um, oh, Kirk, who went Kirk on Gibson. To hit that, Kirk Gibson hit that home run, and yeah. his uh, poor guy's now suffering from Parkinson's disease. And baseball did a terrific documentary about those days and um, Lasorda. But Kirk. And yeah, Kirk was here with the Detroit broadcast team when they were here. I know. He's he still, still manages he's still to get around. Analyst. He has yeah. good days and bad days. That's a horrible mm-hmm. disease. And, um, sure is. Let's hope, let's hope they can do something in, in terms of research and um, not only that, Alzheimer's disease and what have you. Um, yeah, you you got some incurable diseases. Uh, you just, you mentioned it, mu- multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's ALC, disease, uh, a- um, ALS, ALS, Lou Gehrig's ALS. Disease. You know, Tally brought this up the other day. Um, the business of medicine, and no one has seen it from the inside more than you, Jerry. Is there some truth to uh, you know keeping these? diseases going um, because there's so many, much money involved ha, have um, has there been a scandal like that that stands out to you that um, you shake your head and say wow this shouldn't be happening no no you remember leprosy used to be leprosy used to be a terrible disease they can treat leprosy now so it does not exist. Uh, smallpox used to be a terrible disease. They've developed vaccines. Polio, they've developed vaccines. They have, they have found medicines. They're working on cures for the things, but some diseases are very, very difficult to cure. ALS, is there's no way out. All they can do is try and slow the disease process down. But most victims live somewhere between one and five years after diagnosis. And it, it, would, it would be to the drug manufacturer's benefits if they could find something so that their patients don't die. You just keep them going, maintain them. So some of the, some of the things uh, can be controlled, like blood pressure can be controlled, diabetes can be controlled, but they're hard. Blood pressure changes all the time. It's difficult to control. So some drugs work all the time, some don't. They have to develop. Also, oh, you, you the have time. the side effects of these medicines that scare them. You know, you always have, all drugs have side effects. But, you know, we do, they developed uh, uh, antivirals they, for, for HIV. People are, if you didn't get the medicines, you'd die. And now, you remember when Magic Johnson announced that he had HIV in 1991, people thought he was a goner. And here it is 27 years later. 
Uh, they test him all the time. They find very little, if any, uh, cells in his body. But he has to be on the medication, and it, and uh, so if but he he's able to have his life. And same thing goes with all the people who live in San Francisco and all around the country, the gay people or the non-gay people that contact HIV, contract HIV. If they, you know, once it gets to the AIDS stage, you're in trouble. But if you can prevent it, you're okay. And that's what the earlier you get a diagnosis, you better your chance, but you're going to be on it for life. So I think Well, we may, we may have talked about this before, but he had, did magic, the tremendous advantage having all the money in the world to spend on this medication. Yes. And, yes. Um, I think yes. It, what, what's deplorable is that it, it's almost the rich die young kind of thing. Um, but fortunately, people, you know, if, if you lose or, all your assets. Or die young, excuse me. Well, you, you, the, a, lot of, a lot of people who, who have the disease end up going on the Medicaid program. And... Uh, I'm not saying it's the best program, but it does help them. It, it does help them because medicines will cost two, three, four thousand dollars a month, and uh, you know they're going to they're gonna run out of assets. Or even if they're working, their insurance may not cover it. They may have a cap on it. Who knows? But the Medicaid program's been very, very helpful to a lot of the people. Uh, unfortunately, you know, as the prices go up and they're going to make cuts, mental health and may get cuts. Who knows? Uh, I don't know if the HIV programs are going to get cut, but, you know, they try to find often solutions to keep the cost yeah, down. And Medicaid is, uh, is um, California, am I correct? Is not, it all over? Not only California. It's all, all over the country. It, it's federal and state. The state, of California, oh, okay. the state of California funds it, and the feds supply matching money. Now, here we call it Medi-Cal. Is it, is that, yeah, we call it Medi- uh, Medi-Cal. It's, that's the Medicaid program. It's called Medi-Cal in California. Okay. But it's the same all over the country. Yeah. Well, not the same. Each state administers it. Uh, some some states are more liberal, have better benefits. California is very much more liberal in their benefits than, for, let's say, Kansas. Okay. We have a better economy. Yeah. Hey, Jerry, off the subject a little bit, but on the yeah. subject of health, there have been very few injuries in the past few weeks. That's how you have to judge it nowadays. It isn't how many injuries it was at the season or a bad month. You almost have to, it's almost day to day with all these teams. And they have managed to stay relatively healthy. Um, yeah, the, the one thing that uh, was, it was in the John Shea, from the, the reporter for the uh, Chronicle reported today that, uh, Jed Lowry uh, had a, on uh, July 13th, I think it was. He he had an accident uh, with uh, Stephen Piscotti, and he had a leg contusion, and it's been bothering him. His average has dropped down to about 265, and he was in a three for 28 slump until the uh, eighth inning last night when he got that key single. So uh, he says he's feeling better, and you know. If the parts don't work 100%, even, even though you're trying to play through it, sometimes it's a little tough, and people think, you know, what's what's wrong with him? Well, he had a leg contusion, and a sore leg, can't put weight on it, can't swing the bat mm-hmm. the same way. It makes makes a difference. But he says he's getting back to normal, so that's a big help. The, yeah. most, of the most of the injuries on the A's, the A's this year, you know, Chapman was on the DL for a while, but... Uh, Jonathan Luke croy has been healthy. Olsen's been healthy. Lowry's been healthy. Semyon's been healthy. Uh, Connor was on the DL, I think, for a short time. Uh, Boog Powell, the center fielder. Joyce was and, hurt. He lost his job. Matt guys Joyce, have, yeah, he's, he's still hurt. He's still on the DL. Or maybe the keeper. Guys have DL. stepped up. Um, tell us about I'm the jo- new young outfielder, number 22. Oh. Who, Ramon uh, Mariano. Giving them some spark. He is about oh, yeah. as quick a center fielder as they've had recently. He's terrific. He, he covers so much ground out there. Unbelievable. And he, uh, he entered the game hitting 325 last night. Now, he hasn't had that many bat, at bats. And he, he, I don't think he got a hit last night. I don't, I'm not sure he is. He had eight, eight or nine hits last night. Uh, but he uh, he dropped around to around 300. But he's been he's been a very very valuable 
bat in the lineup, right-handed bat in the lineup. And um, so that that's that's good. And they, they A's have such flexibility with their players. Oh, Pender was on the DL. He, they activated him. Pender can play the infield, can play the outfield. Uh, I like him very much, yeah. And that, yeah. It, over the course of the year, they've come to use him and need him in spurts, and he doesn't oh, yeah. disappoint. Yeah, and how about Mark Kenna? Play left field or play center field. Uh, he can play first base if you need him. Uh, right. Stephen Piscotty's been a- anchored in, in right field, but I think he can play anywhere out in the outfield. And the, the and rest you got of the guys, Martini's another one who gi- gives yeah, you Nick some good at bats. Yeah, and he hits from the left side. He's been, he pinch hit last night, but he struck out, and then he struck out in the ninth. But the they they have such flexibility with their players, they really do, and uh, they're getting. Uh, Chris Davis has been uh, outstanding. I think he has 32 home runs, about 90 RBI so far. He's doing exactly what they want him to. Uh, they, you remember before the season started, I said that the A's ought to get LeCroy to be their catcher, and they did. Oh, you did. You you said it about two or three weeks before they actually got him. And uh, what I was very much impressed with was that at the deadline, they kept him. And not only oh, yeah. did they not sell off, but they helped their bullpen considerably with um, a former Matt Familia. Not only Familia, but they got Sean Kelly from the Washington Nationals. Uh, the uh, the Kelly, uh, remember the Nationals won a game something like twenty five to four, and right. and Kelly they must have brought Kelly in to mop up, and he got frustrated and he threw his glove down. And they said, we don't want you here. So they, they, they uh, DFA'd him or put him up for trade, whatever. And he, he just gives the A's another dimension coming out of the bullpen. So uh, they've got they, the, they got one of the best bullpens in the, in the game. Trevino's their seventh inning guy. Familiar's their eighth inning guy. And Trinan, Trinan and gave you up. you got Pettit, yeah, Petit, uh, or Pettit. He's in, narrow, in Petit. The yeah, you got Emilio Pagan, you got Kelly, you got Buckter, who's so so. Uh, Chris Hatcher is sort of on the in the doghouse, if you will. Uh, I think they lost confidence in him, so he's in usually in mop up roles, but so that they don't have to use the you know the other guys uh, if they're losing you know, eight to eight to two and it's the ninth inning, they'll bring in a Hatcher to pitch. So. Uh, but they have a very strong bullpen. They really do, and that's that's the, that's why that's why now the starters know, uh, or Bob Melvin can tell them, give, I want five innings from you guys. Give me give me your best for five. If you make six, that's gravy, but it's okay. We get the guys in the bullpen. They're going to shut them down. And so last night they got five and a third out of fires. Cahill, they can get, maybe get six innings out of Cahill. Anderson is every time he goes out, it's kind of iffy. Uh, he, uh, his fastball is, doesn't exceed 88 or 89 miles an hour, but you know he knows where to, how to pitch and where to pitch. So maybe he he gets the guys out with off speed stuff. Uh, I think, and they got two guys down at Nashville that they can plug in if Anderson can't hack it. That'd be uh, Megden and Montas. Montas is five and three. Megden was six and six. Megden started off uh, poorly, had a great, great May, and then tapered off again. They got injured, and uh, he's down in Nashville. Is he on rehab now, or was he optioned? No, he, he's pitching now. He's optioned. So, okay. And Montas has been up and down, too. So Montas, uh, they got Montas, you remember, in the trade for, Jarrell, uh, with, for Rich Hill. And uh, mm-hmm. Jarrell Cotton and, and Frankie Montas came over in that trade. And, yeah, and Rich talk about, was doing very well with the Dodgers. Talk about team. Talk about team. Yeah, he, he was. I think he got the win on uh, Tuesday night. Yeah, he, he was the winning pitcher. And he, he, you know, he he was on the scrap heap for a number of years. Came back, I think, in 2014 or 15 with the Red Sox. I think it was 15. Pitched very, very well. 
signed with the A's, signed the two-year deals with the A's for 2016 and 17. And remember, he had a blister on his hand, couldn't pitch, and was traded with uh, Josh Reddick for Cotton and uh, Montas. So, and he's been doing very. He had a good set in 2017, and he's doing well in 2018 with uh, Los Angeles. Just a, a veteran pitcher, lefty pitcher, who knows how to do it. Hey, Jerry, what can we look to in this upcoming week? Well, the, the A's, it gets interesting. The, the A's play, are in Anaheim to play three with the Angels this weekend. The Angels uh, were in the news last week as uh, Ken Rosenthal of The Athletic uh, announced that uh, Mike Socia was leaving at the end of the year. Socia said, no way it's going to happen. Socia has been there for 19 years. He probably got aggravated that someone leaked leaked what he was thinking, but he's been there for 19 years. But and if, and I was talking with Amari about this yesterday. At the beginning of the season, he, he thought that the Angels were going to be right up there in the race for the for the division crown. But if you think the A's pitching staff is beat up, you got to look at the at the Angels. I think they got three or four pitchers down for the season. With uh, Tom, well, Hunt Tom, being Tom. one of them, who's probably the most interesting man in baseball right now, uh, Lenny Randall notwithstanding, um, <laughs> incredible talent on both ends of it as a position player. Um, he's got power, and um, as a, as a pitcher, he's been hurt. Um, they're trying to avoid Tommy John surgery. And yeah, as a, a few pitchers have done that. Tanaka is one of them, yeah. but they're few and far between. Yeah, he's uh, scheduled to throw this weekend. He's not going to pitch, but he's scheduled to throw. In the off meantime, the mound. yeah, off the mound. In the meantime, his hitting, he's going to be the DH for the weekend. He's got 11 homers. I think he's got 29 RBIs, which is not a lot for a power hitter, but he gives them a presence in the. In the, in the DH position. Terrific talent. Uh, they, I think they're using the platelet-rich plasma on him to see if they can avoid having the surgery done. But Garrett Cousins, <coughs> who was penciled in to be one of their, their number one pitcher, he went down with it, and they had two or three other guys, I can't remember offhand, their names. They're, they're out for the season with Tommy John surgery. They have eight players, including the four pitchers I mentioned, on the 60-day DL. And they got, uh, well, Matt Shoemaker's coming back off the DL. But their pitching depth has been, is so, the, there's nobody on the in, in the starting rotation again, and their bullpen's beat up. So they've been floundering. They're still at a 500 for the season, but they're not going to, they're not going to make the playoffs. And, you know, uh, I can identify with this as a Mets fan. The Mets have three starters who are probably the best threesome. In baseball, if you, you want to, any uh, Syndergaard, DeGrom, Wheeler, uh, back and healthy and what have you. Yeah. They're, but there's an envelope, and the envelope is, is closing. I look at it the same way as with the Angels having Mike Trout, who's probably the, the player of our time. Um, oh, yeah. Best player. He's one of the best players in baseball. And for them to not win with him and um, end up, which I think they'll almost have to do, is trade him away to rebuild. Um, that's sad. That would be sad. I don't want to see him playing in Yankee Stadium. No, I, I don't want to see him playing for anybody but the Angels. I would right. How would you like to have bird, him? I'll feel good. Of Stanton, Stanton Judge, and Mike Trout. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I know. And then and then Manny Machado at the shortstop for third base. Woof. <laughs> so that could happen after the season too. That uh, oh absolutely Machado could. Uh, could oh Machado's a rental. Machado and Brian Dozier are rentals for the Dodgers. Uh, you know Chase Utley was was the uh, second baseman, but he got he's hurt. And they got uh, Dozier, and Dozier was hitting 350 since he came over to play with the Dodgers. 
Uh, and Machado was a threat. That man is that kid good. He, he, and he, he made he was good with the glove last night too. Yeah. Yeah, well, the shortstop is hurt, and the shortstop is doubly hurt. He's now got um, he's yeah, now got a hip, hip problem. problem. Yeah, that's Corey Seager. Yeah, yeah that's Kyle, yeah. Kyle Seager's brother. So Mach- Corey. Machado maybe end up being um, more than just a, a rental. They could come up and and sign him. They're one of the few teams with the money. Um, to do so. Yeah, well, sure. Well, Seager had, Seager had not only had the problem, he had Tommy John surgery, which is so rare for a position player. But it, that's what happened. And right. It, and it's uh, bad. It, hips, hips scare to, me. Hips can, can be the end of it. I, I think of the end of one of the greatest athletes of all time, Bo Jackson. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah was was hurt and they told him oh that's only a bruise and as a matter of fact they wrote a book entitled about that entitled it's only a bruise and it, it really gave an insight as to how these players are treated like meat um you know oh yeah she, um will tell you you're not hurt um roger maris with the yankees um uh, they lie to him about a broken hand. Um, it's just universal where um, even though it's big bucks, there's still the slave owner plantation system in baseball. Oh, sure. I'm going to give and, you an example. And in sports in general. Yeah, I'm going to give you an example. Up, up in Seattle, uh, Felix Hernandez has been wonderful for a number of years. The, it appears that he's lost whatever he had this season. He's not having a good season. It wouldn't surprise me if the, if the Mariners dumped him very shortly. Yeah, and that's just the way it is. He has yeah. no longer any value. A lot of it is contracts, Mariners. overinflated contracts. Yeah. It's goodbye. Uh, See ya. They'll end up paying um, a part of the freight whenever they dump him. So. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know if I told you the story. I was down in spr- spring training, and the A's had a, a young second baseman, and uh, they weren't happy with him. And they had they had this other guy in, his name was Scott Spezio, and they sent Spezio out uh, on a split squad game to play second base. And he comes back, He comes. they come back from the game, and they call him in. Uh, how did Spezio do? do? He did great. So they called in the other guy and said, we're cutting you immediately. You're through. I mean, the, the, the guy left the clubhouse in tears. I mean, here he's expecting to be the starting second baseman for them. And they just ceremoniously say, see ya, goodbye, get out. Boom, just like that. What can I tell yeah. you? That's baseball. It is a very harsh and cruel game. Just like when they trade you. See ya, or they release you. See ya. Yeah. No, Interesting. It was Specio who ends up hitting that home run for the Angels. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that beats the Giants when Dusty Baker flips the ball. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. His dad. His dad was a ball player. Uh, former baseball player. Yes. And, with uh, Houston, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And then the A's made a trade later that year for a guy to play. I think his name was Ed Sprague to play third base. And Sprague's father also was a was a big big league ball player. And, what was kind and of his about, mother owned. Yeah. Maybe they put it in her name, but there was a team in Lodi, a, a team in the Cal League. In I'm uh, going back to 1981 or two, and um, Ed Sprague's mother and um, and. Um, and wife, the the other Sprague's wife, had the Lodi team in um, in her name back in the in the day. No kidding. Yeah. It's good. It's a good story. But did you know that Ed Sprague's Jr.'s wife uh, won a gold medal and in the Olympics for synchronized swimming? Whoa. You can um, look it up. I, like I think that, that used to be you that event used to be called not not drowning. 
I think they <laughs> eventually, and then they changed right. it. it. It evolved. It, a lot of these women were doing uh, um, PEDs and what have you, but they didn't drown. So the side effects <laughs> of doing PEDs is you don't drown. In that spot. <laughs> okay. His, um, Ed's mom was, uh, I'm an old guy, and this is back 30, 40 years ago. She was uh, quite a looker, if I remember correctly. We, I lived in Sacramento. We'd go down there for minor league ball. And no, I didn't. I didn't know her, so it, you could be right. I, I just didn't know. And I think one of the sprays is uh, an assistant hitting coach with them to this day. Um, Good day. Well, maybe that's the all dreadies. That's a, n- nothing well, Mike out of that. The s- same era, there was there were two all dreadies. One played for the A's, and one played with the Giants. And the one that played with the Giants. Uh, was on that 87 team that um, made it to well, the Mike playoffs. Al- Mike Aldredi, and Mike Aldredi played for both for both clubs, for the A's and the Oh, Bears. okay, that must have been it. Yeah, One Mike Aldredi. And now Aldredi's the coach with the A's. I think well, he's the assistant, assistant hitting coach or assistant bench coach. He's still with the A's, Mike Aldredi. Right. Hey, Jerry, uh, as usual, not only fun, enjoyable, but informative. So, oh, well, thank you, sir. Thank you, my I friend. Hope, and um, I, hope, I hope you like the, the inside baseball with uh, Rick Mundy and Oral Hershiser and Ray Fox. Oh, I wish I were at that table. My God, that um, that's one more, terrific. One more thing about Ray Fox. We were just—he is absolutely adamant. And he thinks it's absolutely wrong that the Giants retire number 25 for Barry Bonds. And, he, and it has to do with the PED use. And we were just getting into the conversation when – Yeah, because, because the A's have been so clean about PED use. Well, and maybe, what with Conseco and McGuire, yeah. oh, yes. Well, and th- – <laughs> Are you kidding me? Fossey's throwing bonds under the bus well, over I'm gonna, PEDs? No, no. no, no. Ray, may not, Ray may not have done it. But the, the, the no, no, I'm, I'm sure he, he didn't. I wasn't accusing but him. One thing, but one thing we were laughing about, wha- one thing we were laughing about, you're going to love this story. He was saying in Canseco's book, Canseco said they were shooting up in the stalls in, in the uh, clubhouse bathroom. And Ray says, have you ever seen the clubhouse song? I said, yeah. He says, you can barely get one person in there, let alone two big guys. And I said, you're absolutely right. We're laughing about that. But, well, but that doesn't – but, but however, that's doing. like – that's a technicality you, when okay. you say something like that. That's like a guy getting, getting a, guy, a guy thrown out of court. He threw the guy down four, four stairs. And they get to court and they say, oh, no, it was five stairs they threw the guy out. We're <laughs> going to dismiss the, the case. Oh, yeah. He or might have been shooting up in the, instead of the stall of the bathroom, which sounded great. They might have been in the runway, which sound, sounded to an editor like a, 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 right. a more right. dramatic. There's shooting so. up in the bathroom, right? Go in sure. there. Nothing in any of Conseco's books has ever proven been proven to be a lie. I know it's amazing. Uh, he, he, was never so, sued. he was never sued by any player mentioned in the books. Yeah, ever. I hope Fawcett gets to hear this because it PEDs were so much a center of all baseball. It wasn't just Barry Bonds. And it was relief pitchers. It was pitchers that he was facing. These guys have to be acknowledged as stars, as great players. They need to go into the Hall of Fame, the Clemens and the Bonds and the uh, countless others, the uh, Palmeros, uh, who 300 hits, 3,000 home runs, this, that, and the other thing, or, you know, what I'm saying. Well, These guys yeah. need to have a note made on the plaque that the statistics may be screwed 
skewed. They were playing in in an era of PEDs. But hey, yeah. it's time already. You can't, and you got you have to honor these guys. Um, as much as I hate to say it, Barry Bonds was the best hitter I ever saw. Well, yeah, one of now, the best. No question. Uh, uh, I think I think in my lifetime, I think Ted Williams was the best that I ever saw. Ted, uh, he didn't he didn't no, do PE. Um, yes, but there was a five year period where Bonds was locked in and putting up numbers that were absolutely incredible. He could not be walked. He could not be struck out. He would not swing at a bad pitch, uh, a la Williams. And, you know, it was, it's time to put the, the thing to rest because it certainly isn't out of the game. You can call them human growth hormones now. Uh, and how many players are still getting caught? Recent years, superstars. Braun. Yeah, we got Cano, we got Cano this year. Cano, Cano this year. Exactly. Whoop. There's always, um, which means, too, that the fight chemist versus chemist, the cover-ups, <laughs> um, sure. it's, it's going on. Um, and you say, well, how could a player risk? They're making $12 million like Cano. How could he risk losing the bulk of that in a season where he's suspended? Well, guess what? If he weren't doing PEDs all this time, he wouldn't be making $12 million. He wouldn't wouldn't have stood out as good as he's been with Hall of Fame numbers himself for the past 10 years. But well, I brought up obviously. I brought up, I brought up Pudge Rodriguez's name because it was alluded that uh, Pudge was doing PEDs, human growth hormone, whatever. And the answer was he was ne- he, he he passed every test. He was never caught doing it. So it's only an allegation. They don't have concrete proof. And if you're going to use that, I don't think Clemens ever tested positive for anything, ever. And so no, why would he, he didn't do anything? It was his wife taking it. Right, but he didn't. He didn't test positive for it. Right. So is that the way to judge? That's why I would assume almost that any player in that decade was more than likely to be involved as either an enabler or um, an experimenter, someone who did it habitually. Um, let's face it, it, um, it was institutionalized. Yeah, but you got to remember, you, you don't vote, I don't vote, Ray Fossey doesn't vote. It's the baseball writers that vote, and it's up to them. And there's been some movement in the last couple of years saying, well, you know, they look at the player and they look at his accomplishments and they look at they look at the use of PEDs, and they look at the whole thing through the prism that you just established. That pitchers were doing it, uh, secondary play catchers were doing it, uh, everybody was doing it, and they were all competing against each other. And so they're looking at through that prism and saying, well, if they're all doing it, and he put up these numbers uh, against guys who were pitching against them, and instead of throwing 95 miles an hour, they're throwing 100 miles an hour, and he still could do it. Maybe you ought to be in the Hall of Fame, and that's why some people look at th- through that lens, and there are others who say people who cheat shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. And well, you'd have to say people who get caught cheating shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, not people well, who cheat shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. And then it goes back to how many people who are in the Hall of Fame now, who there were rumors about, and there is still question about. Um, whether or not some of those players, uh, I could think, too, that um, I'd be surprised if there were no um, PEDs involved. One of them is Nolan Ryan, and yes. one of the, them is Cal Ripken. Um, well, I don't know about Cal. I was thinking more. Well, not to Mike bulk P- up, but for recovery time. Yeah, and I was thinking more in terms of Mike Piazza because of the, those allegations that he was doing it. So you got three players, and the, the aforementioned Pudge Rodriguez is four players 
that they that they think may have, but there's no proof that they ever did. But Nolan Ryan Fitzgerald was what 46 years old, and he was better in his 40s than when he was in his 20s. Right. So you, you you look at that and say that's not supposed to happen. When you get in your 40s, you start to slow down. You've already slowed down. Uh, when you, when a ball player gets to be 35, that's a, he starts the the descent starts in 36, 37, 38 if they can last that long. And most of them are gone by the age of 40. Very few. Jerry, few. you must remember in the 50s when the, uh, I think it was the Russian track team, uh, Russian women, or it might have been Chinese women, I don't know, I don't remember which, were in, accused of being in a doping, in a doping scandal. I, I think it was well, East Germans. These East German Germans. women were... Right. Okay. And so remember, this, remember the remember the skater Katarina Witt, the Olympic skater. There was questions about whether she she was using this stuff too. So okay. it, it's yeah. It's, now it's, my it's, point it's, is the athletic community is kind of a close knit bunch of folks. Trainers talk to trainers, athletes of different um, different sports talk to each other, they get tips from each other. I would say odds. Let's take the odds. There were like 25 players on a team and there were 16 teams. I think it amounts to 800 players um, or 400 players playing in the bigs back then. The odds are somebody did PEDs. Well, they may not have been PEDs, but they may have been doing Greenies, which were benzedrine, or dexedrine. Well, that's that's totally different. Greenies yeah. doesn't change the chemical makeup of your body. And no, it just I, makes you uh, crazy. <laughs> well, it does. Any meth, any anything involved with uh, yeah. with speed of of any kind changes y- your um, your being, your personality, may road rage, all all kinds of crazy. But it doesn't change the chemical makeup where you can recover quickly uh, from no, no. things. And that's what it's about. More than the bulk, it's can yeah. those relief pitchers come back and throw 98 two, three days in a row. And yeah, and that's where the HGH comes in. That's where HGH comes in and helps them recover faster. And, it right. and they don't even have a blood test for that going on um, in – in Major League Ball, look how long it took him to, to get through when when Sosa and um, and um, what's his name the, the commissioner Pud Pud Selig oh. yeah, was, really. was covering up covering that all up. Look and Sosa's going, go ahead, test me any time you want to test me, and the union comes in. Oh no, can't do it. <laughs> You're not going to be tested. Uh, don't worry mm-hmm. about that. Look how long it took him to even acknowledge that it was going on. Yeah, baseball so, was the last sport to get to get serious about uh, use, PED use. Uh, track and field was way out in the forefront. Uh, the Olympics were way out in the front, way before baseball. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if hockey or basketball did it. But boy, I'll tell you, those, those, I don't know how the hockey players do it. They get beat up. Two days later, they're back out getting beat up again. Right. Unbelievable. That's a but, tough sport. Oh, but, is it um, ever? I, I, if, next time you see Mr. Fossey, um, just tell him, you know, he's got to give the, the cheating thing up because I'm sure he's not being self-righteous about it because uh, he doesn't sound like the kind of, kind of person that um, – that did it. No, he played. Like, Ray is very, very, Ray is very old school. He thinks he I, thinks the rules. He thinks the rules regarding the catchers are, are, are babying them. And you know, he said, "I, I would stand in the plate. I took it." You know, now they're protecting. You know, they got the posy rule where you can, you have to, you can't block the plate. You have to create a lane. It's a, it's a different game. And the other thing he said when he was playing. He would play, if he had a night game, he would be on the back of the plate in the day game. There was no such thing as uh, it's, a, uh, you know, it's too much to catch a, uh, a day game after a night game. 
So he thinks you know they're, just, they're making the catchers softer than they were in the past. And so he's old but school. What he's generation old. of ball players doesn't look at the game and say it was better in my day? Oh, yeah. Well, I, it may not have been better. I, I think the athletes are bigger and stronger now than when they were back in Ray's day. But it, it, the training well, methods certainly, are better. They're they certainly don't. more athletic, but they're certainly less baseball skilled. Had a punt, had a hit and run, had a hit and Yeah, punt, where is it? Yeah, it's gone because you can't go up to the pay window and note that I got the runner over from first to second into scoring position in that at bat, pay me for it. No, no, that's an out. We're not going to, not only we're not going to pay you, we're going to take money away from you for that at bat if you, if you look at it in, in that way. And, but it's what the, the folks want. They want the home runs. You know, they yeah, teach these kids in the minors. They instead of spending hours and hours um, to, uh, learning to bunt, they learn to change their swing and put elevation on the ball. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, but I'm going to tell you so, there were two plays last night. That with if they, it just shows that the little things count. The Dodgers were trailing two one. They had a man on first. Guy hits a, a ground ball down to, to Matt Olson. Uh, Olson bobbled the ball. His only play was at first base, so he retired the runner. That allowed the runner to get into scoring position. Guy gets a hit. Game is tied. And then the, when the A's scored, they had a man on first. Wild pitch or pass ball. I, forgot what, I think it was wild pitch. Guy goes down to second base in scoring position. We get a hit. They win the game. So the, the little things in baseball, moving the guys into scoring positions so that they can score in a single, is very, very important. Doesn't and that's, good the, that's the kind of ball the A's are playing right now. And yeah. um, nice He's to playing see. it the right way. Yep. So let's hope for the best and um, stay healthy this week. We'll be back next week. How about that? Yeah, it will be great. I got... Uh, well, we got uh, three games next week with the Mariners, an off day next Thursday, and then we got the Houston Astros coming in. How how good is that? Six games wow. for the A's. Ab- absolute wow. dog days of summer and a pennant race all in one. How about that? Oh, yeah. and, and if they can't put people in the stadium to see those two teams play the A's, uh, I don't know what will get them get them going into the stadium. I, think I would Monday like night, the though. fans to come out to see them, not the Red Sox or the, the Dodgers or the Yankees, or the Giants yeah. or the Yankees. I'd like to, like to see them, uh, like I, you know, just come out for the A's sake. It's great to have um, American League teams come in, no matter what, because um, let's face it, this Northern California Giants owned it first. Oh, yeah, and they still do. They still they, do. And they still but, do. But if you're a baseball fan and you want to see the A's play Monday night against the Seattle Mariners, the A's are selling field-level tickets. You ready for this? $15. How oh. is that? Monday night. Not bad. Any, anybody listening wants to go, take advantage of it. Uh, Dave Cavill and his team want you to be there. It's a good experience. It really is. Well, um, you certainly don't have to convince me, and I'm privileged to have to live in an area where we do have both the American League and the National League. So, um, but to keep it, you got to support it. So, oh, absolutely. Anything new on the stadium? I'll ask you real quick before we. We close out. I haven't I haven't heard anything on the stadium except that they plan to make an announcement by the end of the year. Is, are there any rumors at all in the press box? Anybody saying nothing? Oh, you know. There's no talk about it at all. Um, so, you know, there are now, certain is it things at the that. end of the baseball season that the announcement is expected. No, to be the, the end, end of the calendar year. The end of the calendar year. Okay. 
you got to remember. Well, let's, let's hope for the best, and let's hope it doesn't take him six years to build the damn thing. Yeah, it's it's really a dicey problem. you got too many entities involved. you got the, the city of Oakland and the county of Alameda County, I guess, own the, own the property. So one of the things that's holding things up is should the city of Oakland buy out Alameda County share so that they can negotiate? When you have when you have too many people, you know, there's an old saying, too many cooks spoil the broth. And you get too many people, you get county interest versus city interest. And if they could straighten that out uh, and have just one entity to do the negotiating, I think that would be easier for the A's to figure out what to do. Sure, the, the situation is complicated by, by the fact that the Raiders want to be here for not only this year but next year and maybe uh, a third year before their, their stadium in Las Vegas is, is ready. The Warriors have one more year at Oracle Arena, and then they're going over to San Francisco, and they have to make a decision, what do we want to do with the, the arena? Do we want to rip it down? Do we want to uh, see if we can get somebody to come in? We, what do we want to do? And, of course, you've got city and county starting to get the county supervisors and then the city council for Oakland going at it. How many you know, 20 people in those entities, and no one, there's nobody in charge. And so it, it just gets stalemated. Instead of saying, let's take charge, let's figure out what we want to do, and then get go do it. And uh, it's just a messy situation. Uh, but there is no place for the A's to move. We, we were going over the cities that were potential cities. Portland, uh, Oregon is too small. Uh, the there's no place in the Bay Area where the A's could go other than Oakland. And they, uh, Montreal, we we're discussing Montreal. Uh, they don't have a stadium, so no one's going to go to Montreal. You know, for years uh, they talked about Sacramento. Has that been brought uh, up? Maybe. maybe. Uh, we haven't talked about it. The Kings have done okay because, you know, it, it doesn't take much to – it doesn't – take that much to fill an arena so if the kings ever get good you know they have what, about 19 20 thousand people in that arena it's going to and the arena itself is a draw right now in downtown sacramento so that will do okay it's a beautiful arena have you been to it yet ralph no i haven't no i, haven't. I was i went to the uh, Sac, sacramento state university had their graduation exercises at the arena just a beautiful stadium state-of-the-art nice job and the, the Warriors are going to have that in San Francisco with the Chase Center. So uh, Interesting that the Sacramento mayor um, used to play basketball with um, Johnson. Was yes. His, it was Kevin Johnson. Kevin Johnson Kevin. was a A's third, third baseman, a shortstop in, okay. in the minors at Modesto. Um, he... He was a well, KJ, player. KJ, oh, well, he may have been. KJ played basketball, and yeah, uh, he did. Remember. But he he also he, played he a little to, minor league ball with the A's too. Yeah, yeah. And he he saved he saved the Kings. The this guy Chris Hansen from up in Seattle. Han, Hansen wanted to to buy the Kings and move them up to Seattle, and they was going to build an arena up there. Uh, the people up in Seattle feel that they were screwed. When uh, when the team transferred to uh, OKC to Oklahoma City, uh, you right. got to remember this goes back to Hurricane Katrina. Uh, Hurricane Katrina occurred in 2005, and the team couldn't play at the arena at the Superdome down in New Orleans, and uh, they moved up to Oklahoma City for the for that year, and they did so well. Uh, so the this guy that owned the uh, Seattle, Seattle Supersonics at the time uh, was, I guess, lived in Oklahoma City, and he moved the team to OKC, and they've been there. Uh, yeah, I, I've talked with several attorneys. Uh, Peter Golenbach was one of them. Yeah, I think that it would be wonderful if there was an eminent domain, it, uh, not just baseball, all sports. Yeah, the, c- the city determines if it's going to move if it, you know if the owners can't take care of it you got you have to sell it within um 
to the city, and the, the city um, has the team. What inspired this thinking of, of mine was the Baltimore Colts. That was one of the first uh, first teams that just out and out walked out in the middle of the night. And yeah. it's not like Baltimore wasn't supporting them. They quickly got another team, the Ravens, but the name should have been left in Baltimore, just like the Cleveland Browns, they're, they're a Cleveland team. Oh, yeah. Wait, I agree with it. that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Should have been Washington Minneapolis. Senators should've have been. had that, that problem uh, o- over the years, and... Um, yeah, I just feel sorry. When a team leaves, that means that there are kids that grew up worshiping, you know, 10, 11-year-old guys um, and and girls um, that just, you know, took it, the teams took advantage of them, made them fans. They bought all the gear, and, they, and all of a sudden the, the team is gone. It happened to me when I was 11, and it really does a scar. When, when oh yeah, it see. happened. It happened to the kids. The first franchise shift that occurred. Uh, you you got to remember that uh, in baseball, though, it was about a 50-year period where there's been no no shifts. But 1953, uh, the Boston Braves pulled up during spring training and then went to Milwaukee, and they Good had a great success, they had a great success story in Milwaukee. The first team to draw two million people. And, and it's flamed out. And 13 years later, they moved to Atlanta. And we've talked about this before. There was a team that never had a losing season in Milwaukee. And boom, they were on the go again. Yeah. And that was disgraceful. They just moved down to Atlanta. And as a matter of fact, the A's, when they were in Kansas City, they had moved from Philadelphia around the same time, they never had a winning season in Kansas City. Yeah, well, you're not going to get support. You're not going to get support. But the Milwaukee story was just incredible how they went from the from the penthouse to the outhouse in 13 years. And they had great players. They had Aaron and Buell and uh, Bruton oh, and Logan, Eddie Matthews, Matthews and Del um, Crandall and Don Red McMahon, yeah. Yeah. Red Shandings uh, played second. In the, my, sure. my brave team that I really followed was the 58 team. My yeah. Giants Chris. left in 1957. I rooted for the Braves in the World Series that year very, very tough, very hard. I was a National yeah. League fan. In New York, you were either a National League fan or an American League fan. Right. I couldn't – took me a long time to even – um, be able to say the word Yankees. I mean, um, and both the Giants and Dodgers were gone, so I rooted for the Braves in '58, and yeah. um, they were they were terrific. Uh, Covington and Billy Bruton and, and yeah, they had Joe Adcock at there. first base, Del Crandall, Joe Adcock, Henry Adams, and J- Joe George, Torrey George w- would platoon with with Adcock at first, and. Yeah. Um, not not Joe Torrey, Frank Torrey, Frank Joe's yeah. older brother, and um, uh, terrific times, terrific times. Yeah. How how a team like that could, um, and five six years later, be in Atlanta. Um, yeah, it was horrific. And it, the the real reason was was a five letter word beginning with M and ending with Y. It was called money, mm-hmm. and the 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 Braves could not. They, they're only Milwaukee's only 90 miles from Chicago, and it was Cubs territory. And the Braves couldn't crack the TV market. And someone said, "You're going to have the whole South. You're going to go from." And they, there was no team in Miami at that time, and they had the whole South from and from Washington all the way down to Florida. It was the only major league team in the South, and that's how well, big they, the, the market. The network was. in the the Turner Network. Uh, yeah, have yeah. to admire the fact that they were incredibly successful. Yeah, they just owned the South. Now, of yeah. course, you got the you got the team in Tampa Bay, you got the team in Miami, uh, and, and the, <clears throat> so. But the Braves got the market and they got the money, and uh, and of course they had uh, they, they had that team 
in the 90s with the three uh, Hall of Fame pitchers, Glavin, Smoltz, and Maddox. Wow. And Bobby Cox, 14 division titles in a row. Just a tremendous team. But uh, we're getting, we're, we're, we're diverging. Hey, it's, it's been a great talk. The only thing I have to take homage with you is that you said, and I quote, the A's really have no place to go. I think they do. I think Montreal is out there. I think Las Vegas is out there. And um, that's why I think it would behoove Oakland. It would behoove it um, as a city, not just for the fans, the revenue that it brings in. It's always underrated. If they put a, a, a ballpark in a downtown area like with the Giants, the area is always rejuvenated. Whatever it is, it's happened that way in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. Uh, these downtown ballparks rejuvenate the area. And I yeah, it, you got to have a feel. you got to have a feel for the game. When you go to Yankee Stadium and you get off the station at 161st Street, and you come down the stairs from the from the elevated train, the place feels baseball. There's stuff going on outside the park as well as inside the park. You go to Fenway Park, you go to Comiskey Park, you go to AT and T Park. There's Wrigley's people. like that. Wrigley's yeah, like it, that. It's a party going on in the neighborhood. It's it's exactly that. There's stuff going on in front of the park. There are places around the park to to sit down and have a cocktail either before the game or have dinner before the game, after the game. There's things to do. When you go to the Oakland Coliseum, you get a ball, you get a parking lot. That's it. There's nothing there. And right. so you want to have you want to have the baseball experience, a baseball village, if you will. And that's I think what Dave Cavill understands and what he wants to do for this team. It's just not going to be a ballpark plunked down a, off, a, on, off an off-ramp on the freeway. Nothing well, if they be, put it where it is yeah. now with no intentions to build anything around it, um, it's, it's twofold. It looks like that's the place that's going to need the least environmental studies and, uh, and red tape to build it. Yeah. Um, and it's it's the freeway exits. The Bart's or Bart is already there. I think it's going to come to that. But I'd just like to see it in writing at this point. Yeah, me too. I'd like to see something. Yes, even if it's yeah. wrong. So with the fans, the fans, they they thought they had it last year with the Laney College, remember? And mm-hmm. they were they were shocked when they found out that they hadn't uh, dotted the I's and crossed the T's. They thought they had permission, but the chancellor, when it went to the board of trustees, they said, no dice. You should have come to us first. We would have told you no dice, but you didn't. And it was egg on everybody's face, and they had to go back to the drawing board. And, you know, this is the, the problem in San Francisco is that land is at a premium, and, this, and every bit of land has been developed and with the tech companies buying up all kinds of land, it's really difficult to get a stadium built somewhere in the Bay Area. And the only, in my mind, the only place that they could do it is the current location. And we've discussed that before. Yeah. I wish a few years ago when AT&T T was built, that's a Pac Bell at that time, that the A's and the Giants couldn't f- find a way of uh, sharing that ballpark. It's done in uh, with the Giants and the Jets in, in New Jersey. And yep. uh, one team's out of town, the other team's in town. It would have been terrific. And I think we discussed this, the Gi- Giants manage- management at the time. And the Giants management today probably would be very happy if the A's picked up and left. They're not willing to share the territory at this point in time. And I don't think any changes are coming soon. So it's up to the A's ownership. It's up to the A's management. And they're missing the boat. When both teams were successful, both teams were drawing. 89, for instance, they both went to the World Series, uh, of course. 
And they both drew over three million fans, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. So great. Um, to call Oakland a small team market is absolutely a fallacy. The only reason they were getting, they were on the stipend for um, the kickback on the luxury tax, which is quickly diminishing 25% yeah. a year. And they think they got one more year after this year. Yeah, it it isn't um it wasn't done because they were a small market team. It was done to give them a compensation playing in that field that they're playing in, the Ricky Henderson field. Let's go. Uh the Oakland Coliseum is totally antiquated. But it to be clear, again, it wasn't because they're looked at as a small market team. Oakland is a big city. They've got Contra to, to draw from. They've got the peninsula where um, where you are to draw, draw from. Um, I think once the stadium get, gets in, all is going to be well. But, again, like to see the T's crossed and the dies, the dots, the, the I's dotted. The I's dotted. Now you got it. All right. Takes me a while. It's been a long day. <laughs> hey, thank you, Jerry. We'll be back next week. Uh, hopefully, Nancy will be back with us. And uh, thank you for listening, everybody. See you then. Bye-bye, now.